Hello, Jordan here from Artisan Electrics. Welcome back to the channel. We're here, we've just installed this beautiful solar PV system for one of our customers. And I wanted to talk to you today about 10 things you need to know before you get solar photovoltaic panels installed. Because done right, installing solar PV on your property can be a brilliant investment. It can add a substantial amount of value to your property. It can enable you to run your house on pure, clean energy from the sunshine that shines on your roof. But done wrong, it can be a bit of a disaster. It can cost you more than it should and can create problems down the road. So it's important, just like when making any investment, that you're fully informed before you make a decision. And that's what we try to help our customers to do before we do an installation for them. There are certain things that you need to know, certain amount of information that you need to gather in order to know what kind of system would be good for you, if you can have solar PV at all, and if so, what size array would be appropriate. So hopefully this video will be a benefit to you guys today. If you do enjoy it, don't forget to hit a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and why not share the video out with someone else who might benefit from it too. So question number one really that you need to know is, is your home suitable for installing solar PV system? And most systems will be installed on a roof. So the question is really, what size is your roof? How much open space do you have on your roof? And what orientation is your roof facing? An ideal solar PV system needs to be facing south or slightly southeast or southwest. But um, if it's facing in completely the wrong direction, then it will severely minimize the amount of power that you can generate. So an easy way to check what orientation is of your roof is to go on Google Earth, find your house, and just look at the compass and see which way your roof is facing. Now, on this installation that we've been working on, we've actually got solar across three roofs, and there are ways to maximize the amount of uh, solar output that you get, even if you've got roofs facing in various different directions. So we'll talk about that a bit later, but the main roof in this install is behind me, and that is actually south facing. In general, you're gonna generate the maximum amount of solar energy if you've got a south facing roof, because it'll get the sun throughout the longest amount of the day. But we mentioned size of the roof too. So obviously if you've got a tiny little roof with not much space, there's not much point in installing solar PV because you're only gonna be able to fit a few panels, which will only provide a trickle of solar energy, and it's really probably not worth to install a system of that size. But if you've got a property like this one, for example, this is a single story property, lots and lots of roof space, which is open. There are not lots of things poking through the roof. So like, for example, behind me, there's this little uh, boiler flue popping up. That's pretty much one of the only things that's coming up through this roof. So we had lots of open space. And the other good thing about this property, which you need to consider, is there aren't lots of trees around creating lots of shade on the roof because shading will severely limit the amount of solar production that you're going to have as well. So ideally, you want a roof that's gonna be exposed to the sunlight throughout the day, is not gonna be overshadowed by large trees or other buildings. And if you do have that kind of roof, then probably you have an ideal situation to be able to install a solar photovoltaic system. The other option though, is not just roof mounted solar, but you could, do ground mounted solar. So if you've got a large property with a, a nice plot of land that's open, maybe a field, a paddock, something like that, then actually ground mounted solar is possible where, where you mount the panels on a kind of frame on the ground. And if it's in a big open space with no shading, that can be an excellent opportunity to install solar PV too. So that's the other option as opposed to roof mounted system. So the second thing that you need to know before getting solar PV installed is what type of roof do you have? Obviously there are various types of roofs that you get across different types of property. So here we've got these normal clay pan tiles. They're fairly standard. The good thing about these tiles is they're quite common, they're easy to lift, and they're easy to adapt if needed. So in order to install this system, what we've had to do is lift some of the tiles, install brackets that are fixed onto the wooden joists underneath the roof, 
and then relay the tiles around those and, and sometimes you have to notch the tile out slightly in order to fit those brackets and fit the tiles back around them. On these kind of tiles that's quite easy but if you've got a slate roof for example that can be a lot more technical job to be able to do and it's a lot more difficult to lift the tiles. So that can affect the installation costs because it can take a lot more time to do the installation. And then you've got other options like maybe you've got a flat roof for example you could have a roof that's a lot steeper pitch than this and that might make it a little bit more technically difficult to install the system so the ideal thing is if you can gather information for your installer or the person who's doing the design about what type of roof do you have take a picture of the tiles that you've got on the roof work out roughly the pitch if possible or send a picture of the gable end of your roof so that they can see the roughly the angle of the roof that you've got. They can gather a lot of information from Google Earth themselves anyway which is really handy but if you can get things like the dimensions of the roof and send those over to your installer too all this information will really help them to be able to design the perfect system for you. The other question that you need to answer is does your roof need repairs because if you've got a roof that's very old it might well be that the roof is due to be replaced anyway in which case you could look to install an in-roof system rather than an on-roof system so an in-roof system is actually recessed into the roof itself and generally they look a bit neater than an on-roof system so it would be good to find out from an expert, maybe a roofer or your solar installer might be able to tell you what kind of age is your roof, is it due for replacement soon, in which case you could look at doing that whole thing as one project and it would be a lot smarter to do that rather than fitting panels on the roof and then finding out that five years later you need to replace the whole roof. Even if the whole roof doesn't need replacing, what you might find is that because of what happens over time, tiles get damaged, like this property here where we've been working. These uh, end tiles on the gable end of the roof have just been weather damaged over time. And so what we've done is we've planned for a roofer to come in and do some basic repairs on the roof while the scaffolding is up so that you can make the best use of that time because scaffolding is expensive. So to get it up now for the solar, and also use it for the roof repairs is a really good idea. So if you know in advance that you need some roof repairs, plan that for the same time or just after the solar install is done and then you can get all of that stuff done at the same time. So the fourth thing that you need to think about is how much weight can your roof handle? Now most modern houses, the roofs are over-engineered and you can easily add the weight of solar panels on and it won't affect the structural stability of the roof. But if you've got an older property with very old roof trusses, maybe they've got a little bit of uh, woodworm or something like that, then you'd have to be very careful about installing that extra weight of solar panels on your roof. So something that you want to think about is what is the structural integrity of my roof like? Because imagine I'm here now, we've got these roof gables coming up. The weight that is added on the roof is quite significant from the panels. They are not the lightest things, 20, 30 kilos each panel. When you've got 20 panels on your roof, you're adding a significant several hundred kilos of weight to your roof. So it's just something that you have to think about. And if you're not sure whether the roof will be able to handle that extra weight, then it might be necessary to get a structural engineer to come in inspect the roof trusses, go inside the loft space, have a look, see what the condition is like, do some calculations to see if your roof can handle that extra weight. So the fifth thing that you need to know, and this is one of the most important, is what size array do you want? You could go from just installing a few panels to installing hundreds of panels if you've got the space to do so, but the decision making process really needs to be why do you want solar, what do you want to achieve by installing solar and that varies from customer to customer. A lot of our customers are electric vehicle drivers and they love the idea of being able to charge their electric vehicle from green energy that's been generated from the rays of sunlight that have been shining on their roof. So for them it's more about reducing their carbon footprint going green as much as possible than necessarily trying to recoup the costs over a certain period of time. 
But other people, they do view it as an investment. They want to be able to sell excess energy out to the grid, get paid for that in order to recoup the investment over a certain amount of time. So the reason that you want to install solar PV will affect the size of array that you want to install. Here we've installed 24 panels, nine kilowatts of panels in total, and we've got a six kilowatt inverter. Because we're using a solar edge system here, we can oversize the number of panels more than 50, up to about 50% more than the size of the inverter. And what that enables us to do is, even on a cloudy day, to still get a really good chunk of solar being generated so that we're close to that six kilowatt limit that the inverter has even on a fairly shady day. But the reason we're installing such a large system here is the customer is going to get a battery storage system installed as well. He's got an electric vehicle and he wants to maximize the amount of solar energy that he can produce in order to run his whole house as much as possible on free solar energy to run his electric vehicle on that. And then any excess he can sell out to the grid. And it's a really great investment because this kind of system, a high quality, well specced system can really add value to your property. It's something that as we go forward in the future, less and less reliance on fossil fuels is going to be appealing to people when they buy property. So a property that has this kind of system is certainly going to appeal to anyone who's looking to buy a property. Now in order to install a large solar PV system like we've installed here, you do need to get what's called G99 approval. Any system that produces more than 16 amps per phase or 3.68 kilowatts per phase needs to have what's called G99 approval because you are, have the potential to be feeding quite a lot of power back into the grid and the Energy Networks Association needs to sign off on that in accordance with your local distribution network operators regulations. But don't worry, that's something that your installer and designer can sort out for you. They can do all the paperwork. So if you get a good company who's got a good reputation, they'll do all that for you and get the approvals before they start to plan the install to make sure that you are allowed to install a large system. If you can't get G99 approval, G98 approval is fairly easy to get for most people. And that will allow you to have up to 3.68 kilowatts of solar generation, which is still a decent amount. Either way, you need to know in advance first, what kind of solar PV system do I need? What are my goals? What do I want to achieve by installing solar PV? What's my budget? Do I have a certain payback period? All these things need to be in your mind. And something that will help with that is knowing how much you consume in electricity annually in your property. So a lot of people now, they have smart meters, they're able to check back their records, or if not, just check your electric bill, your meter readings, and you'll be able to see month by month what your average electricity usage is in kilowatt hours. If you can create a little spreadsheet showing that, that will really help your installer and designer to know what size system would be appropriate for you to maximize the amount of solar that you can use, but not to oversize it so that you'll be just exporting loads of electricity to the grid because you don't actually need that much. So it's about getting the right balance according to the size of your property and how much electricity usage you have on an annual basis. So the next question you need to ask is, do you want battery storage? Nowadays, solar and battery storage are becoming more and more common as a partnership because what often happens in the use case for a lot of people when it comes to electricity is they use most of their electricity in the evenings. For example, they get home from work, they plug their electric vehicle in, they charge that overnight. They get home, they start cooking, they turn the hob, the oven on, etc. They have a shower, all these things that need electricity. And so most of the usage actually happens in the evening. Now the problem with that is that solar is only producing when the sun is shining. So during the evening, you're not able to make use of that solar energy because it's not being produced when it's dark. That's where battery storage comes in because what you can do is harness that solar energy that's being generated during the day, put it into a battery system, and then that battery system can then be discharged during your peak times when you're using the most amount of electricity, whether that be in the evening or early in the morning. So for example, if you charge your battery up during the day while the sun is shining, then you get home from work, 
you plug your electric vehicle in and you can then charge your electric vehicle with that sunshine energy that's been stored in your battery during the day. You can use that to charge your vehicle overnight, you can use that to cook, you can use that to boil the kettle, and it's just a great way to maximize the benefits of the solar energy rather than just selling loads of it out to the grid during the day. If you do want battery storage though, you're gonna to need to have a certain amount of space to fit it because batteries are quite large. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And there are certain electrical requirements that you need as well. So let's talk about those next. So when it comes to designing the electrical systems behind the solar PV system, there are certain things that need to be in place and certain bits of information that you'll need to be able to provide to your installer. And the number one thing is what size is your main cutout fuse at your property. I'll show you what the main cutout fuse is because not a lot of people know that they even have one or what it does. And it's in your electricity meter box, which is usually in a cabinet like this or it's inside somewhere. This little box here, this little gray box is what we call your main cutout fuse. And this is owned by your distribution network operator, which is the company that owns all the supply equipment. Essentially what you've got is your main power cable coming in from the road, from your electricity supplier, into here. This fuse protects the whole installation and limits you to a certain amount of electricity that you can use at any one time. So in this case it's 100 amp, it says 100A on there, that means 100 amp. That is what this installation is limited to. Some properties will only have a 60 amp or an 80 amp main cutout fuse. And in that case, you may well need to ask your distribution network operator to upgrade that main fuse to 100 amp in order to be able to get a solar PV system installed. And often customers who have EV charge points installed will definitely need to get that upgraded because of the significant um, extra load that an EV charge point puts on the system. So that's an important thing to check and the best way to do it is just take a picture of this, the inside of this whole box, send it to your installer and they will be able to tell you what size your main cutout fuse is. Sometimes these ones are old and they're black and they don't have a label on, in which case you'll actually need to contact your DNO. You can, you can find out who your DNO is on the ENA website, Energy Network Association website. Search for, just Google search, who is my DNO? and then put in your postcode and they'll tell you who your DNO is and then you can give them a call and say please can you tell me what size my main cutout fuse is so that's one way around it you'll also need to make sure that the safety measures are in place that should be in place according to the current regulations for electrical installations so we can see here we've got these green yellow cables these are your main earth cables so you've got the main earth coming into the property then this one is labeled gas bond that is important that any services that are metal that come into the property like a, me a metallic gas pipe or a metallic water pipe are actually bonded. And so you'll need to check that. You can, you can find that out by simply looking at your gas meter and there should be an earth clamp like that somewhere around the gas pipe, either in the meter box or just inside the property where the pipe comes through into the property. And the same with your water you find your main stopcock for your water if it's an incoming metallic pipe there should be within about a meter of that stopcock an earth cable like we've just seen with a clamp to bond the main water all these things are kind of fundamental foundations for a safe installation so if they're not in place your installer will want to make sure that they're in place before they install a significant system like solar PV in your property the other thing that you'll need to know is where is the consumer unit and are there any spare ways? So let's go and have a look at that now. So the main consumer unit is behind me here. You might know it as a fuse box. That's what often people call it as well in layman's terms, but the official term is consumer unit. And it's basically where the power cable comes into your house and then divides into various circuits that go out to feed your sockets, your lights, uh, apl various appliances and things like that. So this is the consumer unit behind me. And you can see here, it's got a main switch and then you've got individual circuit breakers that are labeled. So we've got two for a cooker, we've got immersion, lights, sockets, etc. This one is very full. 
So there's no space in here to add any new circuits. And in order to install a solar PV system, you need a minimum one additional uh, circuit to be installed for the solar. If you've got battery storage, you're gonna need another circuit for that. If you've got an electric vehicle charging point, you'll need another circuit for that. So you'll need at least three spare ways. But also the battery system and the solar system often have other electronic devices that need to be installed, which could go in the consumer unit if there's space. So in this case, this is way too small. We can't add anything. So we need to figure out another way of doing it. So what we decided to do here is we've installed this switch fuse, as we call it. It provides an 80 amp supply which is quite hefty. We've tapped into the main tails coming into the property and then we've put this switch fuse to protect and then we've run an armored cable from here through the roof over to the garage and we decided to put a new additional consumer unit in the garage which we can run all the new circuits off for the solar, battery storage and electric vehicle charging point. That's a good way around it but obviously you need to have space to be able to add a switch fuse or an additional consumer unit. We could have put an additional consumer unit here and the solar inverter here, but we wouldn't have had enough space for a battery and the electric vehicle charging point needs to go in the garage, not here. So it made sense for us to put everything in the garage and I'll show you what we did and how we've laid it all out and we'll answer some more questions over there. So the next thing that you need to know is where could the inverter go? What is an inverter? Well, this box behind me is the inverter and this does all the clever stuff where it converts the DC power that's created by your solar panels into AC power that can be used by your house, your electric vehicle, or your various things that you run usually during the day. Installations are, are run on AC not DC, so it has to be converted and this is the box that does it. So this is very clever and this is absolutely essential to have an inverter for a solar system, but it's quite a large box as you can see. So you're not just gonna be installing a little circuit breaker in a consumer unit, you're gonna need space to put an inverter. Now we have chosen the garage for this situation because we had a nice big open wall here spare in the garage which is absolutely perfect to mount all the equipment on. And ideally, you do want to have a large space that's free to mount the inverter because it should be mounted on a fireproof board like this. You need obviously an additional consumer unit like we've put in here and there are various isolator switches that need to go in as well. So these are the two DC isolator switches from the main uh, solar cables coming in to be able to isolate those. That's required by regulations. Then you've got an AC isolator as well to isolate the inverter and the AC side of things. You've got generation meter as well, which needs to go in, part of the regulations. And then obviously this consumer unit, which we've installed, which we fed from that 80 amp switch fuse that I showed on the other side. We've got a main switch here. We've got four circuit breakers actually, one for the Zappi charge point, which is this electric vehicle charging point that we've installed here, one for the solar, one for the battery system, which we're going to be installing soon, and then another one for the battery meter, which is this device here. So actually four circuits were needed for, for this whole installation because of having EV charge point and battery storage as well. So you can see this takes up quite a lot of space. We've got a nice document holder here as well. The battery is gonna go here, and that is large. So the actual top of the battery is gonna come to here, and that will go floor, floor to ceiling. We've got an 11, kilowatt hour battery to go in. So that is a large Sonnen battery that we're gonna be fitting. And again, you need a lot of space for it. So all these things you need to think about in advance. And it's just so helpful if you can tell your installer, yeah, like here's a picture of the wall where you could put the inverter and it's, you know, there's loads of space and all these little details will really help to make the planning process a lot smoother and make life easier for your installer, which is what it's all about. So this My Energy Zappi charge point we've chosen because it, it's able to use the excess solar energy to charge the vehicle. So you can see we're actually producing 3.3 kilowatts of solar energy at the moment. Only half a kilowatt is being used by the house and the rest is actually being sent out to the grid at the moment. But we've got it in Eco Plus mode, which means that when we plug a vehicle in, the vehicle will charge 
on the excess energy that's being produced. So rather than sending this 2.6 kilowatts out to the grid, it will feed it into the vehicle and use that excess solar energy to charge the vehicle, which means that they're not relying on the grid at all to charge their electric vehicle, which is really cool. It does have other settings as well, so you can do a fast charge if you need and take from the grid, but it's nice to have that capability when you've got such a large solar system to really be able to maximize how much you use of it. Final thing that you need to think about, can scaffolding be installed around your property? In order for installers to work safely, they need to be able to be up on the roof and not fall off and hurt themselves. So you need a scaffolding system to be able to be put up. And some houses, that could actually be really tricky because ultimately there's loads of obstacles all around the outside of the property. So it's just something that you need to think about do a little walk around the property. Is it clear all the way around? Could a scaffolding system be installed or would it actually be really difficult to do that? Sometimes you can get scaffolding, but it's gonna be super expensive because of how complicated it is. So it's another thing that will need to be factored into the budget of actually installing the panels. And usually solar installers have a scaffolding company that they work with, so they can provide you a quote for the scaffolding as part of the whole package of installing the solar. But they will need to know a few things about how possible it is to actually install scaffolding around the property. So that's the final thing that you really need to consider. So I hope this video has been of benefit to you. If you found it interesting, if you found it informative, don't forget to hit a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and share it out to someone else who could benefit from it too. And if you'd like a quote for solar, battery storage or EV charging, feel free to get in touch with us. Our website link is in the description and you can fill out the contact form and one of our team will get in touch with you to do a survey. Thanks for watching and have a great day.